Hello, today is Wednesday, August 5th, and we'll be looking at Luke chapter 22. So, um, we are entering into the passage, the passion narrative of Jesus. If you remember, at the end of the last chapter, 21, there's about two sentences to talk about um, Jesus entering the Mount of Olives, and that is Luke's introduction to the passion narrative. I don't know why they tacked it back into it just kind of goes with the 21st chapter. And so now in the 22nd chapter and the 23rd chapter, we will get the passion of Jesus. Um, so his um, suffering death. And then in the chapter 24, which is the last chapter of Luke, is the resurrection. So um, let's get started. We have the plot to kill Jesus. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit more about this because I, feel, I think this gets overlooked. We know about been depicted in films and um, stories and and it's the same scriptures that we focus on every single year during Holy Week and Lent and leading up into Easter so but I don't think we discussed the plot the plotting and so in Luke we have um, the same exact story uh, it's just told it's just slightly different and so it highlights a little bit more of um, what's going on with the whole Luke is trying to prove that this happened this way. And so the reason why it's called the plot to kill Jesus is it is, is, is because um, uh, near the time of the Passover, Jesus' enemies, the chief priests and scribes, they're usually named the chief priests and scribes, people whose power Jesus is threatening. Their authority and power is threatened by his teachings and by the people that are following him and the crowds that are following him. So they're afraid of the crowds. They're afraid of public opinion, basically. And so um, they're, those people are looking for a way to kill him and just get rid of the problem, right? And that's back in the first century, I guess that's the best way to do that. Well, what better way to get rid of him than betrayal? from the inside. You need an inside man for this job because they're so threatened by the crowds, they need to catch him in a private moment. That's the reason why they need this betrayal to happen. And of course we know it's predicted that he'd be betrayed. He talks about the betrayal at uh, the Last Supper. He says the one dipping his hand in the cup with mine will betray me. Um, all this betrayal thing is a sort of set in stone However, you need to look at it from the strategic standpoint of the chief, the chief priests and the scribes. So we're always trying to trap him in something. And so what we, this is why we, I point back to that because what Jesus says when they take him in the garden is that he's like, I've been in the temple. You've seen me there. You've been with me in the temple. Why didn't you arrest me then? Why do you wait till, uh, what's the term that he used? Uh, darkness the power of darkness so um, that's what I'm thinking is, is a plot there's there's intentionality behind it you know you when you go to the murder trial and they say you know this person had premeditated this uh, murder well they premeditated trying to kill Jesus and um, so they try to do it from the inside with Judas Iscariot they so they make that plan the plan has been set in motion and then in Luke's gospel, there's a dispute about greatness. It's after the institution of the Lord's Supper. So uh, the reason why I highlight the same, the same Lord's Supper that there is in the other two gospels, but in Luke's gospel, he waits for this greatest conversation until after the Lord's Supper. It's interesting to me. The greatest among them such conversation is earlier on in, in both Mark and Matthew, but he has it here in the Passion narrative. And I think there's something to be said for that. I would lean into maybe some of your things, thinking around that. Um, so then Peter's, the, then the prediction of Peter's denial, Lord, I'll, I'll never uh, do anything against you. And he's like, well, you know what? Actually, you're going to betray me before the cock crows. Um, and you're going to do it three times. And then, um, and then there's a section that is exclusive to Luke where he talks about when I sent you out without, without anything, um, were you in want of anything? They said, no, Lord, we are fine. He said, but 
the time is coming where you're gonna need your purse, you're gonna need your bag as well, and you're gonna need to beg, borrow, or steal to try to get yourself a sword. So he talks about how like they trade in something and get a sword and um, probably baffled by this because he's, he's like always been about peace. And he's like, no, you're gonna need a sword. And, and then he goes back to the Mount of Olives uh, in the evening it's for a prayer. Uh, he's praying earnestly. He's praying fervently and an angel appears. This is only Luke. The angel appears while he's praying, Lord, take this cup from me, uh, and cares for him. And it's similar to the story in uh, 1 Kings uh, chapter 19, where Elijah has uh, been pursued by the king and his wife Jezebel after he's defeated the 450 prophets of Baal. And he hides. Um, he goes, he runs away and hides, and, and he's hungry, and then the angel comes and cares for him. It just reminded me of that. That My commentary didn't say anything about that. I thought it would because it was a very similar archetypal scene with the angel coming and caring for him. So the angel comes and cares for Jesus, and then his sweat became like drops of blood. So this is where we get that image from. If you've ever heard of that, Jesus prayed in the garden, and his sweat became like drops of blood. That is Luke. That's where this comes from. It is only a Luke. And, and then they, it says that the disciples kept falling asleep. Of course, we know that from Matthew and Mark. But they fell asleep because of grief. That's different from Matthew and Mark. Like just, they were just lazy in uh, Matthew and Mark, I guess. But they fell asleep because of grief. And it's sort of like, what kind of grief do you, can you sleep through? Like profound grief. And I know I always ask people when they've lost a loved one or they're going through something, how are you sleeping? Are you eating? Those are my two main questions because I think that's the most important thing. And it's the hardest, most, elusive, most essential and most hardest and elusive when you are going through grief. And they are asleep with grief. And then I started to think about maybe it's more of a, a, a less personal and individual grief, but it's more like a general grief like how people have slept a lot during this pandemic because like grieving not necessarily that maybe your loved one is now used to be there and is no longer there that's a profound grief that's a and everyone can expect that too which is, means you know like not that it makes it any easier it's not it is easier to have like a shared grief around um we can't go out to dinner anymore, or, you know, and it, it's more extreme than that, I understand, but it's, you know, those kind of things that we all share in, and maybe that grief gives you a kind of general fatigue, and maybe that's the kind of grief they're going through, like, Jesus has been talking about all this stuff, it's stressing us out, and we don't know how to interpret it, so we're just exhausted from it, and they're just going to go to sleep, so it kind of gets them off the hook a little bit, because I guess they're lazy in Matthew and Mark, so they go to sleep because of grief, which is different. And, uh, and then in the scene where uh, Judas comes up with a crowd and he comes to kiss Jesus and Jesus says, Judas, shall I be betrayed with, are you going to betray the son of man with a kiss? So that's only in this gospel where um, they have this encounter and he says, he asks Judas, are you going to betray me with a kiss? I mean, that's been portrayed a lot, but it's just, just only this conversation between Jesus and Judas is only in Luke. And also, um, then we have the scene where someone in their party cuts off the ear of the slave of the high priest. Now, that's in all three Gospels that it was a person in their group. It was an ear. It was a slave. It was the high priest's slave. All that's conclusive. Mark actually, it's either Mark or Matthew, I forget which one, gives him a name and everything. But only in Luke does Jesus heal the ear. You, you ever heard that before? Like then Jesus touched the ear and he healed the ear that had been shorn by the sword. Beautiful. Luke gives you so much like redemption and, and comes back, gives you this harsh stuff about the end times and then it comes back and it's like, but I've given you everything you need. You'll be okay through this. The other thing is, you probably also heard that the person who wielded the sword was Peter. That's John. 
John identifies Peter as the sword wielder because John will be start to come along with these stories, especially the Paris Passion narrative. Um, obviously, the same passion is happening to Jesus and John, as, you know, as it does in the Synoptic Gospels. So um, we'll get to that though. That's next Friday. John starts, and so. Um, and this is where he says to them who have come to take him, why, you know, I stood next to you in the temple. I was there during the daylight, but no, you come and take me, um, with the power of darkness. You have, you know, and so let me, actually, I want to look this up so I can read it verbatim out of the, the Bible, because I think it's really important that we talk about this. The way the way it came came out, um, he said, "Have you come out with swords and clubs as if I were a bandit? When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me. But this is your hour, the power of darkness. So under dark is when you're going to come and get me, um, because the crowd isn't there to witness it. Again, public opinion very important to the enemies of Jesus that wanted to." that wanted to kill him. So um, so they take him, and then Peter actually does deny him, like he said he wouldn't, and then Jesus said he would. And he, in, in Luke's gospel, though, it, here's the, he denies it, it's the same people that ask him, and the cock crows, and then in, you know, like the Matthew, it, it crows twice, and he heard it the first time, and knew it was coming, and then he heard it again, but then, but in, in Luke's gospel, he looks at Jesus when he discovers what he's done and he sees Jesus' face. I guess the, what, the, way, the way Luke describes it is that when they took Jesus to the home of the high priest, Peter followed them just to see what was going to happen. And he was in that courtyard with all the people and the people were like, hey, aren't you with him? Like, are you going to break him out of jail or something? You know, that's why that tension, it makes a lot more sense the way Luke tells it. And then he could see Jesus, like, I don't know, through the window or something. And Jesus saw him and he looks at him. And then Jesus is mocked and beaten and brought before the council of elders, chief priests and scribes. So I would imagine that this was a, this was a bad night for Jesus, not just in terms of the physical brutality of it, but in terms of the betrayal and the feeling of failure. You know, he had beaten these enemies of his in that temple every day. He'd, his discourse, he had won the day. And um, they still took him under cover of darkness like cowards. And and also the betrayal of Judas and then the, then the denial of, of Peter. All his friends are deserting him and he knows where he's headed. It's not, you know, it's, it's not just the physical. It's also the emotional pains that befell him and his passion in the passion narrative. So, um, it's unflinching love, sacrificial love. And that's the example that's here. Not, I'm not only willing to give up my body and my comfort uh, and endure pain, but I'm willing to endure emotional pain and humility and being humiliated and um, give all that up and be vulnerable and be totally human for you because I love you. So there's, there it is. Turn it around and something that seems so sad and so bleak can be a message truly of love.